go out. Come on in and find your spot. The doors are shutting. All right, it's good to see everybody here tonight. Another beautiful day. We've had a string of beautiful days in a row here. Very, very pretty weather. I would like to remind everyone to turn their cell phones off so you don't have any interruptions there. I want to welcome some visitors. I know I met some visitors out front. I don't know if they made it in yet, but uh, great to have you visiting with us. I think uh, the Harveys from Wood Avenue in Alabama, lovely family uh, with us this evening, so great to have you folks here tonight. I want to remember our missionary work in our prayers, keep uh, all the many works we support in our prayers. Uh, we have a number of upcoming events. I'll run through those real quick. I don't think there's anything new since Sunday, but uh, we are having a youth devotional and planning meeting here at the building at 2 o'clock on Saturday. So looking forward to that. I see Alan, if you have any questions about that. The Labor Day breakfast annual, I guess every Labor Day breakfast that we have at the Lee's home is at 9 a.m. on Labor Day, which is the fifth week from Monday. It's going to be a baby shower for uh, Wayne and Taylor on the 24th of September. More details to come on that. Uh, and then a couple that were new on Sunday, if you weren't here Sunday or missed the announcements, we are going to have a gospel meeting, uh, a fall gospel meeting here uh, beginning on Sunday, October the 2nd, and then running through Wednesday evening the 5th with uh, Isaac Hall. Uh, McMillan's son-in-law, Olivia's husband, really looking forward to that. Uh, and we are going to kick that off on the 2nd with a friends and family day. So we'll get more details out about that, but we're going to want to get some flyers created and some uh, materials you can use to invite your friends uh, and family to come and join us for that. Again, that's uh, Gospel Meeting October 2nd through 5th, beginning with a friends and family day uh, Sunday morning the 2nd with lunch to follow. Uh, and then the elders, deacons, and preacher planning meeting is set for Saturday, October 22nd. Um, we are going to want, the elders are going to want to meet with each deacon and uh, preacher prior to that meeting just to get an idea of what you're thinking for, kind of talk about how this year went, what you're thinking for next year, and uh, get any feedback you might have for us. So, uh, be getting prepared for that, and uh, for all those who aren't elders, deacons, or preachers, if you have suggestions for next year, uh, now's a good time to get those to the elders or the appropriate deacon, so we can get those things budgeted for for 2023. Uh, we're only, I guess, four months or so from 2023, that's hard to believe. Um, a couple other things, Bluegrass Bible Institute, Thursdays, beginning September 1st uh, through October. Uh, Dave Harris is going to be teaching those uh, classes. I guess you can see him if you have any questions about that, or Steve Davis. Uh, they're probably the most knowledgeable about Bluegrass Bible Institute. Uh, remember to support Grant County. Uh, they meet Sunday evenings, and also Dave does an online devotion for us on Sunday evenings as well. On the second prayer list, uh, we want to remember Sandy Sparks uh, and her family, especially her daughter who's having surgery on the 15th of September. Uh, Doug Yerke's friend, Lynn McDaniel, uh, he's still waiting for some of the swelling to go down after his brain surgery to see like what levels of function he has and what he doesn't have uh, related to his uh, tumor that they removed. He's also going to have to have some chemotherapy and things like that. So he's got a long way uh, to go. So Doug asks that you pray for uh, his friend, Lynn. Uh, also got a message from Doug today that he has COVID, so he's uh, now, now it's kind of passed around their family, I think, uh, over the last week or so. So let's remember Doug. We remember Marcia uh, with her heart surgery, uh, likely later uh, this summer or fall. Um, also, Jeannie Dorton, a friend of Chris Woodard's who had a, a bicycle accident and some pretty uh, difficult injuries from that. We want to keep her in our prayers. Uh, and then uh, lastly, on the sick list or prayer list, uh, Trenton had his angiogram today, and it came back, and they didn't find anything wrong, I believe. So that's uh, really good news. Uh, so now the prayers shift to uh, getting his medical clearance so he can get back to flying and back to his job. So hopefully that'll come soon. But great news on Trenton today. 
Uh, and then lastly, uh, very, very excited about this announcement. Uh, the elders met on Sunday with the Collins family, and uh, they would like to be recognized, and we are very excited to have them recognized as members of the congregation. Uh, it's Jeff and his wife Amy, son Caleb, and daughter Carly. Jeff and Caleb are here tonight. So uh, if you haven't met them, they're fine people. So uh, make sure you get to meet them and know them. But we're really excited to have the Collins family working with us here. Is there anything I've overlooked or that I need to announce? All right, let's begin by uh, having a word of prayer. Almighty God, we are so grateful to be here tonight. Lord, we are grateful for the beautiful day today, the beautiful week we've had uh, to enjoy. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all those who have gathered tonight for our visitors uh, from Alabama. Lord, please bless them in their travels. Uh, Lord, we are grateful uh, to you for the uh, good news from Trenton's angiogram today and pray that he would get cleared uh, very soon to resume flying and, and resume his work. Uh, Lord, we are also very excited and thankful for the Collins family and look forward to working with them uh, in your service here. Lord, please bless their family and may we be an encouragement to them and they to us uh, as we move forward uh, working together here. Uh, Lord, we are mindful of uh, Chris's friend uh, suffering from the bicycle accident. Lord, may she be able to recover from that and ask that you be with her and her family. Uh, we ask that you be with Doug's friend, Lynn, as he uh, recovers after the brain surgery and uh, goes through the additional treatments associated with that. Uh, Lord, we pray for Marcia as she uh, has surgery perhaps later this summer. Uh, we ask that you be with her. Uh, may she feel well and uh, be healthy. And Lord, we are uh, just mindful of all the events we have coming up. We're excited about our gospel meeting our planning meeting, uh, our youth meeting this Saturday. Lord, we pray that you'd bless all of the events we have coming up. Uh, may you be glorified through uh, those events and through all the work we do here. And as we make plans for next year, uh, may, we, may you bless our plans and may we do things that will glorify you and uh, result in uh, more souls being added to your kingdom. Lord, we pray that you bless uh, our time together tonight. We thank you for all those who have prepared lessons and will be teaching the classes. May their lessons uh, be in accordance with your word, and may all the students uh, listen and learn and grow from the classes tonight. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus, for his sacrifice for us, and uh, for the many blessings you give us each day. And we pray that you'd forgive us when we fail you and that we do better. Uh, as we go forward. In Christ's name, amen. Sweet adoration flows from your children. Glory and honor and praise are a part of our constant devotion. Love set in motion for the divine one who Bibles will be in Acts chapter 11, or actually 
Acts chapter 12, sorry, the way it laid out there. I'm going to read a passage of scripture and then make a few points. Taking this from the sermon I heard Sunday on the way down to, on the way over, I guess to, down and over to Harding, so down Elizabethtown. But I want to read this passage and just kind of make a few points that I thought were interesting on, on Sunday. Chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it had pleased the Jews, he pro- proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, the night, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light stone, a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side of the on the side and raised him up saying arise quickly and his chains fell off in his of his hands then the angel said to him gird yourself and tie on your sandals and so he did and he said to him put on your garment and follow me so he went out and followed him and he did not know that what was done by the angel was real but thought he was seeing a vision when they were past the first and second guard posts they came to the iron gate that leads to the city which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. When Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together, praying, And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. I want to think about how Peter must have felt knowing that James had just been killed. And the preacher made a comment. He said, it's easy to die for Jesus, isn't it? Because once you die, if you're a Christian, it's easy. Life hereafter. But it's hard to live for Jesus. And he made a point saying, Peter had a choice. He knew that James was just killed. Peter could have ran, but Peter was still in the area where Herod could get his hands on him And he bound him, and Peter probably thought, in a couple days, I'm going to be dead. But he continued in his faith. So the question I have for you tonight, are you living for Jesus? Because it's easy to die for Jesus. Because once we're dead, and if we're faithful, life gets easy hereafter. But it's hard to live for Jesus knowing the circumstances that may follow if we're being faithful and facing those things that the world has to throw against us. But also want to notice that the church was praying for him. So when we come together on Wednesday nights or Sunday, we offer the invitation, right? The prayers of the church. How much faith do we have in the prayers of the church? And then for us, of those that are being asked, how much are we really praying? They were praying for Peter. Not only once was it mentioned that they were praying, but twice they were praying for Peter. God heard the prayer, and he released Peter. But when Peter was released and he went to the house of Mary, and they were still praying, they didn't have faith in their prayer, did they? As Peter showed up, knocked on the door, You're crazy, lady. That's not Peter. You're out of your mind. No, it was Peter in the flesh. Did they really believe in the prayer that they were praying for Peter? So not only are we asked to pray for one another, but do we believe in what we're praying for? 
And are we really being faithful, thinking God's going to answer our prayers? James says, the prayer, the righteous, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do we believe that? Do we truly believe that? Do we believe God answers prayer? I sure hope we do, because if we don't, then we might as well stop praying. So tonight, if you have a need, that's why we're here. And hopefully we all are praying for one another, and that we have the faith that our prayers will be answered. Maybe not in the way we want, but God still hears our prayers, and he will answer. And are you living for Jesus as Peter was living for Jesus, willing to know the fate of James, yet continue to live and face the consequences that may have come to him? So tonight, if there's any need that you have, as we are gathered together, we'll pray for one another with the right attitude that God will hear our prayers and that we're having faith that God does hear us. So if there's a need that you have tonight, please come as we stand and sing. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning for your the judgment unprepared to meet thy God why so thoughtless are you standing while the fleeting years go by and your life is spent in folly oh prepare to thy God, careless soul, oh heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone, oh how sad <coughs> to face the judgment, unprepared to meet Hear you not the earnest pleadings of your friends who wish thee well, and perhaps before tomorrow you'll be called to meet thy God, careless soul, oh heed the judgment unprepared to meet thy God if you spurn the invitation till the spirit shall depart then you'll see your sad condition unprepared to meet thy God, careless soul, all oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment unprepared to meet thy God. Dismiss the class.
Good evening, everyone. Jerry, thank you for your devotion a few minutes ago. Thank you very much for that. Reminding us to pray for one another. We must do. We're glad to have uh, our, our friends, uh, David and Laura um, Harvey with us. And they are from Florence, Alabama. And they're good friends of ours. And their two daughters, uh, Sophia and Elizabeth. And uh, it's been great to have them with us the last couple of days. And Unfortunately, they're leaving tomorrow, and, uh, but uh, it's been great to see them for the last couple of days. They're a good family, good family, and uh, very good friends of ours. Um, if you're turning your, uh, in, in the lesson here that we have, um, last week, we, um, of course, we covered the introduction uh, on um, the Anti-Nicene Church, and we're looking at the church here from about A.D. 100, 325, um, and uh, next week, we're going to begin looking at, uh, well, we're we going to look at, at what we might call the, the, the victory of Christianity, um, because there are some, some, some victory things that need to be discussed as well. But we're also going to talk about the rise of the papacy, okay, going into what we're going to call the, 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 the medieval church. And, uh, and then we're going to go into a kind of a timeline, um, just for about 100, 150 years or so. Um, and, and then after that, as I have been announcing, we're going to go and look at the church for about 1,000 years, okay? The church for 1,000 years. So that's going to cover a great deal of, of time and, and some important things to talk about. But last week, we covered the introduction here um, of part of this period. This is part five, if you'll look at the, the title and so uh, we've already covered parts one through four. And last week we looked at the introduction and then the subject of monasticism and uh, talked about some interesting things in regard to monasticism. Monasticism is still going on today and uh, uh, not at the level that, uh, that it was um, when it first began. And of course, in the middle period, in that 1,000 year period, not like that, but it's still going on uh, today uh, among Roman Catholics and, uh, and, and some of your Eastern religions, uh, monasticism is still being carried on in those groups as well. Um, but we're at the bottom of page uh, two, uh, the bottom of page two, and we'll cite the scriptures and we'll think about the scriptures as well uh, a little bit tonight as well. But we're looking at church history. That's the, that's the important subject. And I thought that, um, that it would be a good idea uh, before we closed out this period of time for us to be thinking about, okay, um, things that, that we focus on. Um, how does a person become a Christian? What's the process of that during this time period? Um, you know, what, what's that about? Uh, what were Christians thinking about? What were they doing? How were they living their lives? Uh, that kind of thing. So that's kind of be kind of the focus tonight, okay? Be, and, and I think that that's an important thing for us to, to look at. Uh, Ferguson, and uh, I'm referring there to Everett Ferguson, who wrote really a fantastic book on church history from this period of time all the way to the pre-Reformation period. Um, he um, um, died before he could finish volume two and go into, into some of the church history things that, uh, in, in which we remember and we think about in, in the, the more modern time. Um, and so some other people have written that volume two. I've got that uh, book and I don't think it's as good as Ferguson. Uh, Ferguson is a member of the church and uh, was uh, uh, quite a scholar. Um, uh, however, those who wrote 
the, the second volume are not members of the church that I can tell. And, um, and anyway, I, I don't think it's as good as Ferguson's uh, uh, volume. That's just my own personal, personal view of that. But Ferguson, Everett Ferguson is his name, gives one of the best descriptions of the pattern of how a person became a Christian and entered the church in the third century. Okay, so that would be like in the, in the 200s. Okay, the 200s AD. And just some interesting things that went on. You're, you're, you're not going to recognize some of this, okay, from your own experience, okay? But, but some of it you will, okay? Um, because one of the things that we've been tracing, we've been looking at during this period of time are, are the changes and the evolution, especially the evolution in ecclesiastical um, authority, the, the changes that happened there and I think those things serve to be the, the foundation um, for the uh, changes in other areas, okay? We're getting this information from the writings of the, the, of the church fathers, or we call them the patristics, okay? So we're getting a lot of this. They, they describe it. They prescribe certain things as well in their writings. Some of them, some of the writings that we have, we don't know who wrote them, okay? Um, but, uh, but, but many of them we do. Anyway, he gives, I think, one of the best descriptions of, of the pattern of how a person becomes a Christian and entered the church in the third century. The basic pattern remained the same as the first and second centuries with a few changes, and we'll talk about them. There were elaborations in the process over time, okay? Elaborations, okay? Uh, things that, that they said that, well, we, we ought to do it this way. And, uh, and so they built a process of how a person becomes a Christian and so forth. But many were de designed to emphasize or embody the scriptural ideas associated with conversion, okay? Um, so they really wanted to emphasize some of those things, and, and that's well and good, um, although we would argue probably that they took some of their preferences and, and some of their traditions too far. There was generally a lengthy period of instruction and moral examination before admission to membership, and that would include whether you were, were reared in, in a Christian home or not. Um, or you were someone that became a convert later on. So there was this lengthy period of instruction and moral examination before admission to membership, with baptism being the final stage. Okay, so we recognize that. That sounds, that sounds true to us, however. Sometimes candidates would come under instruction for up to three years. Okay, up to three years. And I know that, that um, missionaries many times not during this period, but, but even during the modern period in the 1700s and 1800s, many missionaries would go into foreign lands and they would instruct people for long periods of time before there would be a conversion. And uh, I remember Adoniram Judson, a great story about him going to, to Burma and, and preaching there. And the first convert uh, took a very, very long time, but not because the individual didn't want to become a Christian, but because uh, Judson and others said, well, you know, you need to go through this process of instruction first. So anyway, uh, so this is kind of, kind of interesting. So up to three years some, sometimes, moral prescriptions were given to candidates. Uh, slaves were instructed to obey their masters. Married persons were instructed to be content with their spouses. Prostitutes and magi magicians were often not considered for church membership. Okay, so there was kind of a kind of a drawing of the lines here. Pagan priests and soldiers were told to cease their professions. Okay, baptisms were usually not conducted immediately. Easter was the primary, and I'll say often was the primary day to be baptized. But preparation began the previous Thursday. If you think of Easter being on Sunday, um, the, the preparation for the, the actual baptism itself began on Thursday. Preparation was spent in prayer, fasting, confessions of sin, and the reading of Scripture. Uh, early, on, uh, sun, or early on Sunday, the administrator 
that would be the bishop himself or his representative. And, and we've looked at already that, that uh, even um, in, in the second century, uh, great authority was, was beginning to be given to a single bishop in the church, and he would preside over the Lord's Supper. You know, when we do the Lord's Supper today, we, we, have, uh, we have different ones, and, and they're not the elders usually, but sometimes an elder might do that as well. Um, but they would have one of the elders, and, and we would say the elders, but they would say bishop. Okay, they would draw a distinction between them. And so the bishop would preside over the table and would preside over marriages, weddings, and would preside over um, the, the baptism. And they would pray for the Holy Spirit to sanctify the water. Okay? Uh, children were baptized. Uh, I mean, children of age. They would be baptized, uh, and then men, and, and, then, and then women, and all were baptized separately. Okay? The candidate would stand in the water. Here's, here's how they would do that. The candidate would stand in the water. And the administrator would put one hand on the head of the candidate. Three questions would be asked. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? Number two, do you believe in Christ Jesus, the Son of God? And number three, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, and the resurrection of the dead? They kind of want to put all of those three things together. And each time the candidate would answer, I believe, to each one of those questions, the candidate would say, I believe. After each response, the administrator would push the person's head under, under water so there would be a triple immersion. Okay? Um, someone decided, um, groups of, of people decided that there would be the, the, the triple immersion. So that's how that would, that would be practiced. Later practice would involve for exceptions such as being on one's deathbed, the administrator's hands would scoop some water from a basin and pour it over the head of the candidate, okay? Now this was, this was not widely practiced, okay, at, at first. It became more of a practice, obviously, but, but not at first. I immersion was the preferred way uh, to do baptism. And of course, you know, the Greek word for baptism means um, immersion, okay, of course. Um, after the third immersion, the person's head would be anointed with oil, okay? They would do that. After drying off, the person would enter the assembly. The bishop would pray over them, and then the individual would join the congregation in prayer and in the kisses of acceptance, okay? So there would be the embraces, and there would be the kissing, and, and that kind of thing. Finally, there was often a baptismal Eucharist, uh, which included um, a, a cup of water, symbolizing the, the previous washing of sin, and a cup of milk and honey, symbolizing um, the food of infants and entrance into the Lord's promised land. Okay, kind of an interesting ritual, tradition there that, that developed. Baptism was understood universally based on the teaching of the New Testament to be for the purpose of washing away sin. That was fairly universal. I mean, that was a fairly universal idea, concept um, that was taught and, and was practiced. Um, the confession of faith, before we go on to the next section, this, this section is important. The confession of faith at baptism was considered so important that infant baptism did not become routine until the fifth and sixth centuries, okay? So uh, that was put off. The, the idea of infant baptism was not widely practiced. And even then, it was by necessity, according to Tertullian. Necessity, okay? Why, why would there need to be necessity? John 3, 5 was understood to be an absolute requirement of baptism. You remember Jesus talking to Nicodemus and said, you must be born again. Uh, to see the kingdom of God. And he questioned Jesus further about that. Nicodemus did. And, and Jesus said, you must be born of water and the spirit. And they understood that. They understood that being born of the water is baptism. Okay, there wasn't a lot of debate about that. Okay, like there is today, there's, there's a great deal of debate about what does it mean to be baptized of, 
of, uh, or, or to be born of water. And uh, there wasn't in those early days a lot of discussion about that. But, but small children or infants would be baptized only when there was an imminent threat of death. Okay? In a time when infant mortality was high, many parents wanted the security of knowing their babies had received um, the grace of baptism, okay? Um, you know, depending on your level of understanding of the scriptures, I would think that if you understand the scriptures well, then you're not going to, to uh, then infant baptism is not going to be important yeah, the, the, when we think about the grace of baptism, and I'm using that phrase, the grace of baptism, because that's, the, that's what some of the church fathers, that's the, that's the terminology that they use. But they said, they said, you know, uh, with baptism comes the grace of God and the forgiveness of sin. And so uh, uh, before an infant would die, then, then they would want this to be done. Okay? And you can understand if you don't, understand the New Testament well, and this is what you've been told, um, then you can understand, you know, people's thinking. That, that, that seems to make sense. Questions or comments about that? Okay, well, this was, this was kind of the practice. This was the practice in many, many churches. By the way, as we have noted before, and as we will continue to note, um, the church in Rome took the lead in a lot of this for a, a lot of different reasons. It was a large church. It was a large church. Um, uh, the, the church in Rome was fairly stable in terms of its leadership. Um, and so uh, it was considered an apostolic church, okay, because it had been associated with the apostles. Many believed Peter and Paul. And so if Rome was doing something, if Rome was practicing something, that was considered to be, well, that's a good reason to do it, okay? That's a good reason for other churches uh, to do this, uh, do, to do these things. Uh, and then that will become more and more of an insistence kind of thing um, when Rome uh, gets the ascendancy as far as its uh, clout and, and, and authority. David, go ahead. Other than uh, uh, probably the short answer to that is um, going back to kind of what I just said about the, um, the church in Rome, it's leadership structure. Um, it's the leadership personalities in Rome. Um, it was consistent. Um, it was strong leadership. The other churches didn't, didn't really have that consistency of personality and, and that kind of thing. And so um, they didn't have as wide influence. At first they did, at first they did. And during this period of time, they would have had some, some authority, some clout. Um, but as the years went on, and as you're going into to 325, where you have the Council of Nicaea, then, um, then Rome gets, gets uh, for different reasons, for different reasons, um, Rome um, has the ascendancy and, and more authority in some of these other churches. Great, great question, and, and uh, there's a great deal of competition between the, what we would call the authority of the church in Rome and the church in Constantinople, okay? Because that would be the new capital, okay? That was going to become the new capital of the Roman Empire. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but still, even with that, the church in Rome, um, uh, had greater influence and greater power than the church in, in Constantinople. Again, for a couple of different reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Great question. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there were people who were believing that and, 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 and who were writing about that and saying that. 
but not yet. I mean, I mean, you had some that were saying these things, but not with not with 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 um, uh, great influence. Okay, with, not with great influence. Now later on, of course, we're going to be studying. We have to talk about in church history. We have to talk about Augustine, and Augustine is really going to be pushing this idea of Adam's sin and and people inheriting Adam's sin, and that's going to to be a major teaching of what we have been talking about as the Orthodox Church, the Universal Church. And there are going to be some pushback against Augustine as well, but Augustinian theology is going to, to take the, uh, the ascendancy here in Roman Catholic theology, okay? And in Protestant theology as well, okay? But especially before Protestantism comes on the scene, it's going to... Augustinian theology is going to, to have the, the, the upper hand um, in, in, uh, in the Orthodox Church. Great question. Great, great question. David, sure. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've talked about yeah, we, we have talked about that in the past, and we've talked about different, different movements, some of them strange, some of them odd, like the Montanists. And, of course, the Gnostics are very, very powerful, even during this time, are very strong. The Marcion churches are, are strong at this time. Um, so you, you, do have, you do have counter um, positions that are being taught um, and things like that. The, the, the most important question for us has been, and we've addressed this somewhat, is uh, where's, where, where are those people who are just following what we would call New Testament Christianity? Where are those people? And there's not a lot written about that. Okay? There's, there's just not. Um, you know, as, as they say, when you have the power, when you have the influence, then you get to write the history. And, uh, and these, um, so... There's not a whole lot being said um, at, that, at this time, at least, of those particular groups. And again, too, you've also got to consider the, the, the question, which is a very important question, and that is, what access do people have to the New Testament? What access do they have? Today, we, we have many, many thousands of manuscripts available to us, and some of them were being written at this time, or at least copies were being made at this time, and later on in the three and four and five and six hundreds, many, many copies are being made of the scriptures. But what access did the average person have to those scriptures? Uh, it's a great question. That's a great question. I'm not sure exactly how to answer it. Um, but many people, the missionaries and others, um, they spread the message of the gospel. Um, was it diluted? Was it unadulterated? Was it pure? Um, we don't know all the answers to those questions. Okay. Yeah, David? Well, that's a, that's a good question. The guidance of the Holy Spirit, um, the, the providence of the Spirit uh, being involved um, um, at this time. Yeah, I mean, you have, you have the providence of God at work. Um, sure, God, God doesn't just uh, break off his providence um, at the end of the first century. Um, I don't believe that, that God would do that. Um, so... You know, to what degree, to what degree you have God inserting himself and where and when, um, sometimes that's, that's, that's a hard question to, to answer, you know. Um, it really is, unfortunately, unfortunately. The great thing about it is today, and we've said this many times before, um, we have access to the scriptures today. Um, I think there's, I don't think there's any question about it. 
that we have access to what God would have us to have access to um, in our time, the, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament for that matter. All right, the next paragraph. Great, great, great questions and comments. Um, uh, I appreciate all of those, really. From the earliest days, from the earliest days, the church had established the custom of meeting for communion and worship on the first day of the week. And from the earliest days, the Lord's Day was distinguished from the Sabbath. Christians also met in secret meetings early on Sundays to avoid persecution. Keep in mind, that during this period, all the way to about 325 or a little bit before that time, persecution is what's going on in the church right now. And that's, that's tremendously important to recognize uh, this, this movement of persecution. Plus, Sunday was not a day, a rest day before the time of Constantine. Christians often met together for a meal in the evenings. Most meetings took place in homes. By the third century, Christians began renting or buying property for their meetings, and that's because persecution was not always consistent. Okay, you don't just always have an emperor who says, "All right, I want to wipe out the Christians." Um, you don't have that going on, you know, in a practical way. Diocletian uh, was one of the emperors who certainly made that attempt uh, and tried to destroy the the scriptures as well, but. Uh, um, but sometimes persecution was sporadic. You know, you'd have more persecution in one part of the empire than you did in the other. You've got to realize that, that Rome had other concerns and other things going on in the Roman Empire besides um, this group of Christians that they wanted to, to kill and persecute. Okay? You have the barbarians that they're dealing with. Okay? You have uh, the Rome, Roman Empire falling apart in in many respects and rome was had to contend with that okay and so the roman soldiers and the legions were quite busy um, with other matters instead of persecuting christians Uh, speaking of the providence of god there you go um, those things Um, the earliest accounts of sunday activities include reading from the apostles or prophets Okay, so, so see the, think about the Christians meeting together in, in small groups, a sermon, praying, singing of hymns, uh, a cappella, by the way, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. The Lord's Supper, referred to as the, the Eucharist, okay, that's the Greek word, and it means thanksgiving, okay? When they thought of the, the Lord's table, maybe they wouldn't have a table like this, but, but when they met together in their huddled groups, sometimes, many times in secret, um, they called this thanks, the Thanksgiving. That's what they referred to it as, the Thanksgiving, with bread and wine mixed with water, okay, mixed with water, and a voluntary contribution for those in need. In the first cent- two centuries, there was an absence of temples, altars, and images in regard to the assembly. But in the third century, cultic terminology like priesthood and that kind of thing was introduced, Um, liturgies, um, the formation of worship plans, okay, those were introduced and they became common. Sometimes ministers were called priests, church buildings were called temples, Um, communion tables were called altars, and religious art was becoming common, but not quite icons yet, which mean, you know, like statues and and those kinds of things, Not, not, not really yet in a big way. Various writings of the Apostolic Fathers indicate that many Christians were in the habit of fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays in contrast to the fast uh, offered by the Jews and pagans. Um, So there was a concerted effort to say, you know, we we want to do things different. We want to distinguish ourselves from, from pagan religions. Sources also show that Christians were enjoined to pray three times a day and to begin each day by meeting together for instruction in the Word. Many also adopted the custom of reading the Ten Commandments and other texts on morality. They, included, uh, they concluded that the prohibition on killing included abortion and child abandonment, which was uh, rampant in the Roman Empire. And Christians um, said, no, that's, that's not what God would have us to do. 
and then of course prohibition on uh, adultery including fornication and homosexuality. There was great emphasis on the condition of the heart as well as outward obedience. I want to I you to pay special attention to this next paragraph um, because this is very, very much um, what is needed in our time, I think, as well. Okay, Christian apologists made the case that the moral life was central to the argument of the truthfulness of the Christian life. And so there was great emphasis on honesty in business, sexual purity, family solidarity, doing good to your, na- to your enemies, uh, caring for the poor, daily prayer, and obedience to, to laws. And indications are this manner of living proved to be a powerful factor in converting pagans to the faith. Here, here's an interesting comment, and really uh, Ferguson kind of lays this out more broadly than I do. A person could be ordinary and uneducated and still live a life of spiritual power and motivation. This was very attractive to people. It makes sense. The writings of some pagan historians and philosophers of the day attest that Christians believed in a future life of punishments and rewards, lived contemptuously of death, restrained themselves in terms of cohabitation, and practiced self-control in matters of food and drink. And this set them apart from their neighbors who were pagans or the unbelievers or atheists, okay? This kind of lifestyle set them apart. You know, we, we sometimes, and, and it's good to spend time thinking about arguments and how to give reasons for our faith and how to verbally do that, and all of that is important. It's very important to do that. But, but really one of the most important things to do is just live the Christian life. Live it solidly. Uh, live the beautiful Christian life, as Jesus suggested in Matthew chapter uh, 13. Little is reported about, uh, among the patristics pertaining to women. It's generally believed that uh, the numbers of Christian women were greater than the numbers of Christian men. Uh, women are mentioned primarily in their traditional roles as wives and mothers. However, the celibate life um, was often adopted by women who never married and by widows, some even living together in small communities. They would live together. Uh, most notably, some of the most heroic martyrs were women, and I've made that uh, point before, and women were heavily involved in missionary outreach. Um, among the Montanists and Gnostics, Montanism uh, started with, with women uh, claiming to have prophetic uh, uh, gifts, and Gnostics were in, engaged in public preaching and other worship functions, but by and large, New Testament strictures against women taking on public spiritual uh, leadership roles was uniformly followed in the mainstream churches. Last but not least, okay, in just a few minutes that we have, Christian hope um, was a huge factor in the Christian message during this period. As you can, you can imagine, because the, the, the Christian hope is one of the powerful messages that we have today that the world does not have. Hope sustained believers during times of persecution, uh, understandably. Many believers adopted a chalistic view, more commonly referred to as premillennialism, that the righteous would be resurrected first at the coming of Christ, and then he would begin his 1,000-year earthly rule in Jerusalem. Many believe this. Uh, Many believe this. And at the end of this period, the unrighteous would be raised to judgment. This was the view of Tertullian. But many others espouse an alternative view that the righteous dead go directly to heaven and that there is no earthly manifestation of the kingdom. Still others held to the biblical view that both the righteous and unrighteous dead go to the Hadean realm and that they will be raised to judgment at the advent of Christ and thus begin their final and eternal abode. So, um, now, I I didn't really want to tackle and go into premillennialism at this stage, but I want to do that later on, okay? Because that's going to become a major point uh, later on to look at when we look at church history. Let's look at the conclusion very quickly. In some respects, 
The condition of the church at the close of this period was in serious decline. Vast changes were occurring in the church that were taking it in a direction not advocated by the apostles. The centralization of authority and ecclesiastical evolution and the departures from the faith that resulted did not resemble what was ordered by the apostles. Then, as now, customs and traditions developed to the extent that they became fundamental representations of the faith. For example, even now, it is commonly believed that Christianity prescribes and promotes a special priestly class. Okay? Uh, when, when you are talking to people, a lot of times in the world, they expect you to, to, um, to, to promote this idea. Or at least that's the idea, that's the image of Christianity that's presented by the media. Okay? That, uh, that uh, there are priests and... and I am referred to many times, okay, as, as a priest, okay? Uh, and, and this is the image that people have of, of Christianity, okay? So uh, that's, that's it's kind of interesting, but it was that kind of promotion began during these, these times, okay? However, these early centuries witnessed a church that was largely united in its teaching as the various sects came into being, flourished for a time, and then perished by degrees like Gnosticism and Marcionism. It was a purified church in terms of its relationship with the world. Uh, those worldly compromises, those will come later in a big way. It was an organized and disciplined church in contrast to the Roman Empire, which was decaying inwardly. And it was an expanding church. Missionaries traveled far and wide to distant lands well beyond the limits of the empire, and many thousands were converted to the faith during these years. And all of this occurred in spite of persecution. All right, Probably, you know, I, I've mentioned persecution and how heavy that was and what a force that was during these years. But persecution, I mean, I mean uh, missionary effort, that was huge during this time. And uh, the, the, the faith spread far and wide uh, during this time. In comparison to paganism, which had so dominated the world, the Christian faith proved to be more than a match. The meaning and vitality of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son of God and the hope of eternal life that followed offered the world something never before known. It was simply better to be a Christian than it was to be anything else. Okay? Even though you have these, this evolution going on, um, you, you, it was still better than any message that they had ever encountered uh, before. Missionaries, just think about that. Missionaries going into these strange lands that worshipped other gods, and you hear about the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and, and explained and pointed out in a, in a way that's attractive, and this is the way of salvation, and you can have eternal life. This was attractive. Let me end with this. The church always would do well to remember the words of Jesus in John 17, 20 through 26. So important. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, and, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, uh, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me, before the foundation of the world, O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Notice here how Jesus takes the love that the Father and the Son have, and of course the Spirit as well, okay, that they have, and this love is to be one of the uniting factors in our lives with one another and with God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But notice the emphasis on unity, on one. And that unity is all over the New Testament. But unity that is established on the foundation of the Word. Jesus says that. 
on the basis of the word, not just unity for unity's sake, but unity based on the word of God. So many things that we could talk about from John chapter 17. Our time is up. Um, who will do the closing prayer? Okay, thank you, Ron. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the many blessings you give us each and every day, Lord. We're so thankful for Jesus. I pray that they, it, he uh, died in a, for forgiveness of our sin. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we can be good Christians. Pray that we are so thankful for our brothers and sisters that meet here from time to time, Lord. We, so, we pray, Heavenly Father, as we leave here tonight, that... Uh, you be with us and strengthen us. We'll be good examples of you to our next point in time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.